So, folks, I want to speak to you this morning from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 21, where it begins, Therefore. The title of my message is Responding to the Mercy of God. That's what this passage of Scripture is all about. Responding to the mercy of God. The gospel of Christ is not about us reaching for God, but about God reaching for us. That is unique in the world amongst all the world religions. It's the only one in which it's not us reaching for God, but it's God who's reached down for us. How, how suitable, how applicable at the time of Advent. The Christian life is not about God responding to us, but about us responding to God. I want to point you to one word in the passage that was read to us in 1 Peter 1.13. It is the word, therefore. And preachers always say that with the word therefore, you've got to see what it's there for. Couldn't resist that. I said to myself before, don't say that, Matthew. And I did. This word has a claim on being the most important word in the New Testament. It's because it's not about God responding to our works for him, but about us responding to his work for us. You can see it in places like Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul has spent 11 chapters talking about the mercies of God. And then in that first verse of chapter 12, he says, Therefore, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You can see it in places like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, where Paul has spent three chapters telling us of the glories of what the Father has done for us through the Lord Jesus. And then he says in chapter 4, verse 1, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. In each case, Paul had spent a number of chapters describing to them the wonderful things done for them. And then he proceeded in the rest of the letter to urge the believers to respond and to show them how to do it. And what are we to respond to? The mercy of God. Peter in verse 3 of this chapter praises God for his great mercy which he has brought to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is mercy? The Oxford Dictionary describes mercy as compassion, forbearance shown by one to another, especially an offender, who is in his power and has no claim to kindness. Let me repeat that. Mercy is described as compassion, forbearance shown by one to another, especially an offender who is in his power and has no claim to kindness. We are in God's power. He holds our lives and all our ways in his hand. He holds your life. He holds my life. He is the decider of our eternal destiny. He holds our life in his hands. And we have no claim to his kindness because we are, in the sight of God, offenders. We have no claim to his kindness. We have all rebelled against him and have no claim to his kindness. But God has shown compassion and forbearance. He has not judged us as he should. He has shown mercy in sending his son to die for us on the cross. A verse in Titus chapter 3 verse 3 says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. 
We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Can you look back on that sort of life? I can. Think about your former life. That was us. But then we've got the wonderful word, but. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we were not deserving of his mercy, he gave it abundantly. Peter writes in chapter 2, verse 10, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the Old Testament, as many of you will know, God ordered the building of the tabernacle, the place where God's glory would dwell. And right in the middle of that was what was called the mercy seat. And upon that mercy seat, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the, great, the high priest would come and he would sprinkle the blood of a perfect lamb, a sacrificed lamb for the sins of the nation. Praise God. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 that we've all sinned come short of the glory of God, but we can be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And the word he uses there is mercy seat. Jesus was our mercy seat. And it's wonderful that God said to the people of Israel, he says, there I will meet with you. Where the blood is shed, I will meet with you. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short, but we can all have mercy. Amen. That's the wonderful news. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Peter begins his first letter with exulting about God's mercy shown to us in the death and resurrection of his son Jesus. He talks there about we have new birth. We've been born again. We have a living hope. We have an eternal inheritance that will never perish, will never fade, will never be stolen. And that because of that, because of having that wonderful hope in our lives, we rejoice. And praise the Lord, folks, no matter what our situation and the sorrows that we go through and people go through, there's always something to rejoice in even in the darkest hour, because of his mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Then Paul, in the rest of that chapter, I'm going to glide over this very quickly, because it's not the center of, of what I'm speaking about. First of all, just in those later verses, from verse 6 to 9, he explains the purpose of the sufferings that they were going through. Because these, these believers, they were scattered and to, to a far-flung places, and they were going through rough times. They were getting rejected and ostracized and persecuted, and so on. Life was really, really tough. But Paul there speaks to them about the purpose of their sufferings, that actually God is able to work through those very sufferings and produce the gold of genuine faith in our lives. And then in verses 10 to 12... He talks to them about their salvation and the privilege of it. He talks there about how the prophets who prophesied of the coming of Jesus wanted to know who is this, who is this for? Who, when is this going to happen? Who is it about? Uh, and uh, he talks there about the angels want to look into this amazing thing. But Paul is really saying, they wanted to know about all this thing, but it's for you. 
And three times I notice that in those verses, he says in verse 12, I think, he uses the word you three times. It was for you, it was for you, it was for you. And folks, we can say to one another today, it was for you. It was for us, it was for you, it was for me. How wonderful that is. It was for you. How are we to respond to God's mercy? Notice this is where we come across the big word, therefore. How are we to respond to such mercy? Four things that I believe this passage of scripture tells us about what, how is the right way to respond to God's mercy. The first of those is by hoping for the Father's grace. Therefore, he says in verse 13, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace that is to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Notice the NIV here says, set your hope. Now, the way that we think of hope is, well, I hope so. It might happen. I hope. Biblical hope has a certainty and a confidence in it. Set your hope on the grace that's to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. What are we to hope for? the grace that's to be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed. That inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Notice that this inheritance is kept for us, who through faith are shielded and kept by God's power until the coming of the salvation. What does he mean? Well, he's meaning the coming of his kingdom and having a part, inheriting the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world. But notice here how he starts by saying, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope. Folks, our minds are very important because isn't it true that it's often in our minds where the troubles come, where the doubts come. And what he's saying is, get your minds alert. Um, it, it, was, it was as if he was saying, um, roll up the sleeves of your mind. You know, don't be a, just a, you know how it is we can just be bumbling through life. And, and, but be alert in your thinking and fully sober and set your hope upon that future grace that he's got for us. You see, there's a danger of missing it. It's all too easy just to let life push you around. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I went to a uh, reunion of some old friends uh, from college days years ago. And um, it was in Bristol. And they'd agreed to meet at a certain hotel and we're just going to have a meal together and, you know, some time just to get to see each other again. And I thought, oh, yes, Bristol. I know Bristol. Yeah, it's all right. So I thought, no, I didn't uh, really make any preparations about finding out the route. Well, you know the story. Me thinking I was so confident about the route and getting there... I found that the route was more difficult than I thought it was. And before I knew it, I was sort of on the M5 and the M4 and da da da, and time was going by. Technically speaking, I missed the meal. The, only they were kind enough to um, delay it. So I delayed everybody, you know, but as it were, technically, I missed it. Why? Because I didn't set my course. You know, nowadays we have the sat-nav, don't we? And uh, we get used to putting the destination in the sat-nav. 
and it'll take you there. Folks, spiritually speaking, we need to put New Jerusalem in our spiritual sat-nav. Do you get what I'm saying? That we, we are a people who set their course. That we don't just hope and wonder and so on, but rather that we are be a people who have made their decision, like the old hymn said, you know, to be a pilgrim. I set my course today. That is how God wants us to respond to his mercy. That we set our course, we make a decision in our minds. That's where I'm heading. And we make that our route decisively. Secondly, we are to respond to God's mercy by obeying the Father's will. Notice he goes on to say in verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, ignorance of God. What we can see from this, folks, is there are right, there are right desires and there are wrong desires. And much of our life is actually played out according to our desires. Our desires are very important. We can have right desires and we can have wrong desires. How do I know which is which? Well, right desires are those that are in line with his word. And wrong desires are those that are contrary to his word. So it's easy to find out whether the desires I have are right desires or wrong desires. And God tells us very clearly that we are to yield to right desires and we are to say no to wrong desires. Reject those desires that are disobedient. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Titus 2 verse 12, say, say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Paul in Romans chapter 6 verse 12 and 13, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. You see, folks, I think it's very important that we need to realize that taking up our cross involves saying no to things that are contrary to his word. In whatever sphere of our lives it might be, we can check out what is right and wrong according to his word. Embrace desires for obedience. He says, as obedient children... As Paul said in Romans 6, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Thank God because of the Holy Spirit, he gives us right desires, the sort of desires to be obedient to the Father. He empowers us to be obedient to the Father's will. He makes us willing and able to do the Father's will. Thirdly, not only do we respond to God's mercy by, my first point, hoping for the Father's grace, not only by obeying the Father's will, but thirdly, by fearing the Father's judgment. Notice he goes on to say here in verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Notice there's a difference between what we call fear, you know, <laughs> and godly fear. Noah was a man who had godly fear. By faith Noah, we hear in, in Hebrews, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. Noah took God's word seriously. 
And what he did, he built the ark to save his family. It's also important to say that believers are not judged for the sins of their former life. Praise God that when you came to Christ and you repented of your sin and you believed on Jesus, the past was wiped away. Praise God. Old things passed away and all things become new. Praise God for a clean slate. But we will still stand before the judgment seat of Christ. God has appointed that day in which he will judge the world. And believers too will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you and I, and we will give an account for the life that we've led since that moment that we gave our hearts to the Lord Jesus. Folks, that is a sobering thought. We should be sober people when I think one day I'm going to stand and my heavenly father in that day will be the impartial judge. Notice it's an individual judgment. He says each person's work. We will stand alone. We will not be with anybody else. We will stand before the Father. We will stand before Christ alone. Nobody else will be there, folks. It's a works-based judgment. Notice each person's work. What an incentive for us to work for the Lord, to work with the Lord, because one day we're going to give an account and he's going to ask, what have you done with what I gave you? Isn't that sobering? We are to fear in the right way. We are to reverently fear his judgment. He is the judge of all. It is an impartial judgment. You know, there'll be no twisting of the rules. Oh, yes, it's Matthew. Oh, yeah, we're good. No, impartial. We will not stand there as favorites. In, in any shape or form, his judgment will be impartial. How sobering. No wonder Paul says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Jesus said, do not fear those who can only kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And he said that to believers. Fear him. And fourthly, the fourth and final way that we are to respond to God's mercy is by valuing the Father's redemption. Notice he says here, for you know, in verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you re were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Folks, if somebody saves your life, you have great feelings for that person, don't you? You hear sometimes of these times when somebody's been hauled out of a river or something like that, and they are absolutely indebted. You know, they, they express... They express, they respond to the fact that, that that person has saved their life. Notice how costly it is, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish or defect. There's, no, there's nobody else. He was the only one. How costly. I don't know if you've heard of that film, The Passion of Christ. I've never actually watched it in full because I don't know that I've got the guts. I tried the other day to, to look at it and you have to verify your age. 
because it's too ghastly for younger people to look at. And that's what our Jesus went through. He went through that ghastly cross that we're reminded of again this morning. It wasn't just silver or gold. It wasn't just God writing a check. It, it, it took blood. It took him coming from heaven and humbling himself even to the death of the cross. The Holy Son just mocked and made nothing of until he was a, and I'm not swearing, bloody mess. Precious Jesus. No wonder Peter says to them, to you who believe, he's precious. He's precious to us, isn't he, folks? He's the only one. He's gone all the way to the cross. He's given everything he did, everything that he could. He's precious to us, isn't he? To you who believe, he is precious. How personal it was for your sake. And how transformative it is because he says he redeemed you from your empty life that you had before. And now he's brought you into his fullness. Hallelujah. I want to end this morning, folks, by reading just that brief chapter in, Roman, in Revelation chapter 5. Where John gets the vision of Jesus. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? In other words, who, who, who is able to get us out of this, uh, out of being lost forever? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. In other words, he's able to save us. Then I saw a lamb looking as it if it as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshipped him. Isn't it right that we respond to our wonderful saviour? Folks, I just want to close just by repeating those four things that we have seen this morning. What's a right response? It is to be holy. Be holy, he says, because I am holy. Be a holy people. How do we do that? By hoping in the Father's grace, setting our course, making a decision. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. 
Secondly, by obeying the Father's will. Being obedient, saying no to those wrong desires that are contrary to his word and saying yes to the good desires that he gives us that are in line with his word. Thirdly, by fearing the Father's judgment, having a reverent fear that we will stand before his throne and give an account of our lives one day. And fourthly, by valuing the Father's redemption, by responding in our hearts of love for the one who came and gave his life, a lamb without blemish and without spot. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Let's just pray. Thank you. We respond in our hearts. We respond in our hearts, Lord. Thank you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.